Drag on a race car is largely considered a lower priority than downforce. The drag budget is usually determined by the engine power and the percentage of full throttle in a lap, which would mean that lower drag is required for less available power. Reducing drag can be most similarly thought of in terms of weight reduction, applied through small incremental improvements. However, reducing drag is probably more difficult than both downforce and weight improvements. This video will go through the principles of drag in terms of information theory and apply them to the results of Airshaper's latest version of their Formula 1 car model. So what contributes to a car's drag? We'll start with the drag force equation, where the drag force is equal to half the coefficient multiplied by the air density, frontal area, and velocity squared. The only parameters we have control over are the frontal area and the magical coefficient number that condenses all the aerodynamic properties into one non-dimensional number. As the frontal area cannot be altered much, as it is space dominated by the chassis, wheels and wings. Out of each of these elements, the rear wing becomes the only part of the car that is tunable for drag reduction. The frontal area of the wing can be changed according to whether the car is running at a low or high speed track. DRS applies this concept by changing the second element's angle. A decrease in the wing increases top speed at the expense of downforce and cornering speeds. Therefore, if most of the frontal area is set and so inflexible, we're going to have to dig into that magical coefficient number to reduce the drag. It's pretty interesting that the complexity of a Formula 1 car's aerodynamic drag can be reduced to this number. There isn't really any clues given as to how to reduce this number as it is a non-dimensional number. It's just pure information, as such we're going to need to map this information onto something. Obviously the information is bound to how the air flows over, under and around the car. Airshaper includes this scale in their report, illustrating how drag coefficients change relative to the tested object. Apparent is that adding complexity tends to result in a higher number. For example, an exposed person on a bike relative to a person inside a cabin. Then the value of 0.91 for this car, with all its downforce creating bits, can be compared to a generic truck. But then, the truck has a much larger frontal area, and that would mean it is more likely to require more power to maintain an equivalent speed. So now we have the first important idea, complexity. A basic introduction into information theory will show how this idea sits in a theoretical context. For information theory has this idea, Entropy is a probability measure of complexity. This is derived from Ludwig Boltzmann's entropy in thermodynamics, but the non-dimensional and more general version. For thermodynamics and its second law, the concept states that energy tends to flow from high temperature to low, that is from low entropy to high. Boltzmann's entropy formula is the probabilistic definition of this equation based off the number of states in his case corresponding to how the ideal gas reaches equilibrium. Information as derived initially by Shannon using the general non-dimensional version of Boltzmann's entropy is the quantifiable amount relative to an event. High probability events have low informational content. Information entropy expands on this and is the information of a random variable that can be used to understand how frequently a measurement needs to occur to represent a signal or in this case a geometry. That is, a low entropy geometry will have a lower probability of being represented because features are less likely to be captured. To put it another way, a complex geometry has low entropy and will have a high probability of being represented through a larger number of random samples. It's basically increasing your poly count of your model for CFD meshing. All this means is that the object's drag coefficient has a colliery of the entropy of that geometry. However, this isn't enough to definitively conclude information depicted in this way is the reason the object's specific coefficient needs that amount of energy to push through the air. But, we can say based on information theory and the notion of entropy, there's a suggestion reducing the complexity of a model will reduce its coefficient. Obviously there is a bit more to it than that, because also indicated on this scale, there is appearance of simpler shapes with higher values than ones that are more complex. There wouldn't be many that would say that a sphere is more complex than a teardrop shape. So is it actually the complexity of the shape, or is it the other thing, the fluid? Well, it can only be the other thing, 
Now we can change the idea that the complexity of the model increases the coefficient to the complexity of the fluid flow induced by the object influences the coefficient. Therefore, it's the information carried by the fluid that is more important. This idea ties well into the frontal area being a parameter of the drag force equation. Because you increase this parameter and you increase the amount of air impacted by the vehicle. So yeah, size is important because the larger amount of air is able to carry more information. But it doesn't tell the whole story with this parameter. And that is because the wake of the vehicle is where the disturbed complex air sits. With a large vehicle, it is inherently going to have a larger wake, along with a high pressure zone at the front, which the reference area is hinting at because force equals pressure times area. However, it becomes more apparent how the size of the wake is impactful when seeing Formula 1 cars or really any other open wheel race car in the wet. The wake size is much larger than the vehicle itself, and therefore also its influence. So now we have an understanding that complexity is important, and inherently more air can carry more information. Therefore the wake is larger and more complex, then it will be because the car or the object produces more drag. But this is still a bit abstract, and we don't really know what this large and complex flow looks like. For an analysis, this drag needs to be visualised in some sense. So there needs to be a way to map information onto the airflow. Downforce is usually visualised through low pressure regions on the underside of the surface or negative Z, because low pressure is the dominant influence. Drag in a sense is opposite, where we would want to identify the high and low pressure regions in the X direction. The less difference is the aim, so drag forces tend to be much smaller, and it is more complex as skin friction becomes more important, particularly with low lift airfoils. Looking at a coefficient of pressure plot around a wing profile, downforce is dominated by the low pressure. Drag is more of a combination. Where high pressure air at the stagnation point accelerates out of that region, it drops in pressure, developing thrust on the forward surfaces, reducing drag. Then if the pressure gradients are too high because of acute geometry, it can cause laminar flow separation. This geometry in a sense has a local wake with recirculating flow and with the inherent increase in flow complexity and therefore drag. Normally flow separation is avoided at all costs, but then there's Formula 1's F ducts that reduce the size of the rear wing's wake. For an airfoil, separation removes most of its lift and increases the drag, which is almost all of its function. A Formula 1 wing's primary function is to generate as much downforce as possible, which tends to lead to relatively high drag. A low drag airplane wing would typically have a lift to drag ratio of at least 15, usually higher. A Formula 1 rear wing is about 4 to 8 depending on downforce levels. This high drag is mostly a product of the low pressure on the backward facing surfaces. For the F duck, separation for a high downforce wing reduces this significantly even though the air is now more complex. This is the trade off between a larger but less complex laminar flow or a more complex turbulent weight for a car designed for aerodynamic performance. For a vehicle that doesn't have high aerodynamic performance needs, it would then want to look more like a wing with a highly tapered rear, hence a teardrop shape, but it isn't always possible to have a nice tapered rear with an integrated trailing edge. The trailing edge is then distributed around the perimeter of the car's rear. An example is the hatchback, or its analogue, the armoured bluff body. The geometry at the rear will inherently have surfaces adjacent to either vortex structures or fully three-dimensional turbulent recirculation in the wake that is lower than the atmospheric pressure. The three-dimensional complex flow averages out and is basically the general wake. A vortex structure is a little different. The flow having less structure means that it is less complex than the turbulent air. This higher entropy vortex structure is created through a pressure gradient. When looking at a vortex with total pressure, that is energy, it doesn't highlight features well, because it is including all the parameters, static and dynamic pressure, that make up the energy in the airflow. This is because the vortex is still laminar flow, with the lower pressures masking changes in momentum. For such a dramatic change in how the airflow is behaving, total pressure doesn't describe the flow, but only the fact that disturbed flow exists in that field. In a similar way, 
Calculating circulation around the airfoil will give you a good calculation of lift for potential flow, but this is enabled to give the value of drag for an airfoil, as drag is mostly dominated by the shear stress values. In an absurd and ideal sense, potential flow says downforce is free or at least has super high entropy. This suggests that the vortex structures present at the rear of the car represents drag caused by the low pressure laminar flow on the rear facing surfaces, like the rear window, which it does as it is the definition of induced drag. This induced drag is present as entropy in the large wake as mentioned before. The low entropy as indicated by this paper is, is located at the vortex's core. So the point is, information theory introduces probability into an aerodynamic analysis through the concept of entropy. Placing an object in a fluid stream increases the probability that the flow will end up becoming more complex and thus increasing drag. Similarly, like the drag coefficient, the Reynolds number is another magical non-dimensional number that fits nicely here. This number states that the longer the object is in the fluid flow, the greater the probability the fluid will become more complex which is exactly what happens in boundary layer growth caused by the shear stress from the body and fluid interaction. Then another for those who know, the stroll number became important for 2022. There are many of these numbers and each of them can be broken down in a similar way. This is the basic idea of information theory in fluids. There exist research papers using Shannon's entropy for fluids with a similar approach so there is some further reading for those interested. Currently, this theory is not necessarily a predictive tool, but an analysis tool. Really, it hasn't been developed enough, though I wouldn't be surprised if similar methods are used in industry. In a similar vein, the lattice boltzmann method is a newer method for fluid simulations, which is likely going to be more popular because it is computationally better. In a sense, machine learning does this scalar manipulation both implicitly and explicitly, going by how many papers referencing entropy, it is becoming more explicit than not. However, that is, it's a bit haphazard at the moment, as there isn't a general theory of information at the moment. Anyway, this is about race cars. Now I'll use these methods described before in analysing Airshaper's model to identify problematic areas of high drag and illustrate some solutions. Together there are about three specific areas on the car that I'll look at, that will use different methods to identify them for their informational content. First I'll look at the rear wheels, then the side pod leading edge, followed by the halo and helmet region. Open wheel race cars have the inherent problem of exposed high drag wheels. These have large high pressure regions on the forward surface, high shear stress regions caused by their rotation, with a large and complex wake. All of this is bad, there cannot really be any direct weight control measures, as the geometry is fixed. Not mentioned before in the theory is the multi-bodied approach needed here. Basically it's changing the state of the air, impacting the geometry caused by something usually upstream. Using the logic defined earlier, low entropy air impacting another piece of geometry would, would be less likely to add as much information to the air than if the air was originally high entropy. Exactly like the slipstream effect for a following car. Therefore, looking for upstream geometry is required to approach this problem. Streamlines can be used for this. Influencing the high pressure field in front of the wheels is a bit more specific, rather than trying to aim low entropy air at the wheel. Seeing on the corresponding chassis is a high pressure region that reaches across the rear engine cover, forward of the rear wing and wheels. If the high pressure region can be altered to accelerate air over this bodywork, the high pressure field can be reduced in size thus reducing the rear wheel's drag. A way to do this would be to delay the tapering of the side pods closest to the rear wheel. The leading edge of the side pod is particularly messy, showing unnecessary complexity above the inlet next to the chassis. The wall shear stress map shows a high value wrapping up over the side of the chassis, followed by a low value behind the leading edge, indicating separation and turbulent flow. The line integral convolution on the surface gives another visual aid for following the direction and path of the air. Even more clear with this is the separation above the side pod. This close up view suggests high pressure air in front of the inlet escapes above the side pod because the bottom leading edge is further forward than the top. The inner edge at the interface to the chassis is quite blunt. Thus the pressure gradient is too large, 
wrapping the air up in a bubble of separation. So rounding the corner off would be a first step in addressing this. If the lower edge is going to be so far forward, it might be an idea to bring the round further forward, thus delaying and pushing out the pressure gradient from that corner. Also while we're here, the rear view mirror stay. The interaction between the mirror body, stay, and side pod isn't very coherent, suggesting misaligned stays. But I think it is rather the mirror shape. The hint is the air is rotating correctly down the side pod, drawing laminar air down. However, the mirror will always have some sort of influence on drag. But without doing detailed study with numerous iterations, it is a bit hard to know what to fix other than to copy solutions found on other real world cars. This image here is a good view of all the flow around the cockpit. The size and shape of the separation on the side pod inlet is quite apparent. A cross section of the velocity magnitude shows how much energy has been taken out of the virtual wind tunnel. It stretches right along the side pod and therefore would have a significant influence on drag. Around the cockpit and helmet there are mandatory safety features that you can't do much about, but subtle changes can be influential. A change to the halo model was the sharpening of the horizontal trailing edge. This reduced the size of the wake and changed its shape removing some of the rotation, likely reducing its drag. The problem now is the corresponding negative downstream effect. The wake is now significantly smaller but also higher, lifting the turbulence above the helmet, resulting in significant separation on the helmet because of the large and sharp driver cooling inlets. This sequence of images across the cockpit illustrates the energy being removed from the air that is slowing down to the car's speed. In conclusion, reducing the drag is a matter of adding lots of little bits together, removing bits of low entropy air, delaying the side pod tapering, making sure all the radii on the leading edges are large enough and avoiding tripping the air. Anything that isn't producing downforce needs its wake size reduced as much as possible.